This is a record of people who have suffered an unprecedented disaster. In this episode, we visit the town of Okuma, the site of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. On March 11, 2011, a huge earthquake and tsunami struck the power plant. With systems out of operation, reactor cores melted down and explosions followed. It's so shocking to see something like that. We completely destroyed the myth of safe nuclear power we had always believed. Our neighbors and plant workers believed that nuclear power was safe. They never dreamed that there could be a hydrogen explosion or a meltdown. The long-trusted myth of safety was shattered. Personnel who remained at the plant to work on recovery were helpless in the face of nuclear reactors that were running out of control. Nothing we could do would improve the situation. Even if we restored power, there was so much debris. It was pitch black. All that debris everywhere kept us from making any progress. That's what we were hearing. We wanted to get out as soon as possible. But we couldn't. There were explosions and the terror of radioactivity. These are the voices of people who lived with, and whose town was taken by, the nuclear power plant. Before the disaster, Okuma had a population of 11,000. In half of the households, at least one person worked at the power plant. Now the entire area has been designated a hazard zone, and people are not allowed in. This is the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, located to the northeast of town. It began operation 40 years before the accident. Before the plant opened, there was very little industry in Okuma, and many residents worked away from home. The plant provided jobs that spurred development. They called it dream energy. There was nothing here in this rural area, and they leveled the hills and built concrete company housing. It must have been a festive atmosphere with everyone coming together. People didn't have to leave home to find work anymore, and the town prospered. Lots of things became possible. People thought, well, if I can get a job in the nuclear power field and manage to find a good spouse, then my life will be set. It's like we kind of assumed it was natural to have a nuclear power plant in the community. When we were in elementary school, they take us to the plant on school trips to show us how it worked. They told us it was safe. That's how they explained it to us. They presented it to us that way from the time when we were young children. So that's the only way we knew how to think about it. For many years, the people of Okuma believed the myth of nuclear safety. And then disaster struck. A terrifying magnitude 9 earthquake. During the ongoing aftershocks, 6,000 plant employees and contract personnel kept working. 
When the earthquake struck, units 1, 2, and 3 were operating. The remaining three units had been shut down for routine inspection. Satoshi Kinoshita was working for a subcontractor. He was erecting a scaffold around Unit 1's reactor building when he felt a violent shaking. That earthquake lasted a long time. There'd be a big shock, then it would be quiet a while, then another shock. Things were moving around so much, it was impossible to walk. I had to crawl on my hands and knees. That was one heck of a quake. In the confusion, most of the workers near the reactors retreated to an office building on the plant grounds. Munehiro Ishida, an employee of a subcontractor, was assigned to maintenance of the reactors. He went to the office to confirm that the reactors had shut down properly and waited there for his colleagues. We confirmed that all of our employees were safe and then gave the okay for everyone to go home. There were a lot of workers at the plant, though, so there must have been thousands of cars trying to get to the highway at the same time. There is only one road from the plant's gate to the highway, and it was completely jammed with traffic. Meanwhile, another disaster was looming. Satoshi had fled Unit 1, heading along the shore, and he realized it was coming. I knew that a tsunami would come. I could see that the water had receded. We had a water intake facility on the shore where we pumped in water. There's a bay there, and the water level had gone way down. A huge tsunami, more than 10 meters high, rushed toward the power plant. The seismic isolation building is located about 300 meters from Unit 1. Designed to withstand large earthquakes, it had begun operating just eight months earlier. About 400 employees took shelter there right after the quake. One of them was Takashi Sato, who also worked for a subcontractor. As an on-site technician, he had a team working under him and nearly 30 years of experience conducting safety inspections. A command center was established in the seismic isolation building. Personnel were ordered to remain on standby for recovery work. To get a better picture of the situation, Takashi kept notes on all the reports that flooded in about the condition of the reactors. We had a monitor hooked up to TEPCO headquarters, so I kept notes on our interactions with them. I also copied down what was written on the whiteboard in the command center. They soon discovered that all of the power sources had been disabled by the tsunami, which meant that the reactors were not being cooled. Just the fact that we had no power was very serious. We felt that the plant was in an extremely dangerous situation. It was pitch black. All that debris everywhere kept us from making any progress. That's what we were hearing. So I knew the work was not progressing at the reactors. Before dawn on March 12th, pressure rose quickly in Unit 1. It was decided to vent some of the air in the reactor out into the atmosphere. I heard they were going to vent the reactor. Of course, I realized that meant there would be radioactive leakage. So I knew the situation wasn't normal. My house was about five kilometers from the plant. 
So naturally, I was worried about my family. But preparations for venting took time, and the situation got worse. Takashi heard officials from TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, engage in tense discussions with the government about when venting would take place. I heard that the Prime Minister's office wanted to talk with Mr. Yoshida, the plant manager. I heard people talking about it. They said that Prime Minister Khan wanted to come and visit the plant at that time. But people working there were occupied with trying to restore power. They couldn't accommodate the Prime Minister's visit. That's the kind of thing they were saying. If the Prime Minister came, all work would come to a standstill. We just didn't have the leeway for that. Radioactive material had begun to leak. At this time, radiation levels at the plant's front gate were eight times higher than normal. A serious crisis had developed at the plant. And yet, neither the national government nor TEPCO provided the neighboring community with reliable information. As a community, we had always talked about coexisting with nuclear power. Coexistence was the watchword. Local residents worked at the plant, after all. Under the circumstances, I expected that they would keep the town informed. Just before dawn, town officials were focused on the coastal district damaged by the tsunami. Jin was busy directing his subordinates when he heard some unbelievable news. We heard that policemen, all dressed up like space aliens in white protective gear and masks, were guiding people. We wondered what was going on. The police told us we had been ordered to evacuate. I couldn't believe it. I called the prefectural disaster headquarters and they told me the same thing. I knew then that we had to get people out of there. That was when the mayor received a call from the prime minister's office telling us to evacuate. Until then, people within three kilometers of the plant were told to evacuate and within 10 kilometers to stay indoors. But at 5.44 a.m., the evacuation zone was increased to 10 kilometers. Shortly after 6 a.m., all residents of Okuma were ordered to leave. However, the government still did not tell residents that there was a crisis at the power plant. When I got up, I thought he was going to walk the dog, but he says to me, we've been ordered to evacuate, that we have to leave right away. I was wearing an apron like this one, and I just kept it on. I didn't even take a change of underwear with me.